most of the evening, so, so it would be a question of, of sorting out the choir as well. Uh, good morning and welcome back to the third and fourth Bampton Lectures. My name's Jane Shaw and I chair the Bampton Trust and it's our great pleasure this year to have as our lecturer Professor Willie Jennings from Yale Divinity School. Uh, lectures one and two were fantastic. I'm pretty sure lectures three and four will be equally fantastic. This is how it works. Willie will give the lecture number three from now until 11. Then there will be a half an hour coffee break here in the church for those of you present and uh, those of you at home or in your offices, we hope you will take a coffee break at that time and return at 11.30 in person or online for lecture four. So lecture three is Overcoming the Delusion Condition of Home Ownership, Professor Willie Jennings. Good morning. It is a joy to be with you once again. Please allow me to once again bring warmest greetings from Dean Gregory Sterling, the faculty, the staff, and the students of Yale Divinity School where I have the joy of serving. I want to also take a moment to thank once again uh, Dr. Jane Shaw for extending this wonderful invitation to me. I want to thank the staff of Harris, Manchester, especially Kate Wilson, and all those who have made our stay here so absolutely wonderful. I honor the great courage and wisdom of Dr. Shaw. And I continue to pray that these lectures will represent her great hopes for the future. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge Dr. Patricia Daly, the first black woman appointed to Oxford University who is here to thank her for her presence. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Alicia Lola Jones of Cambridge University and also a graduate of YDS, Yale Divinity School. And please allow me also to thank Dr. Anthony Reddy, 
of Regents Park College for his gracious kindness to me. Such a joy to be in the presence of one of our great theologians. Deception is a tool best never used. Howard Thurman takes this proverbial insight and draws it to a stunning use in his day. Deception is a tool best never used, especially by the disinherited, especially by the poor and the oppressed. Thurman, with this spiritual guidance, <clears throat> is taking away a weapon of the weak, to borrow a term from James C. Scott. Because Thurman, because for Thurman, using deception, even in the face of overwhelming oppression and subjugation, leads inevitably to self-deception and the cheapening of life for those oppressed. Thurman was keenly aware of the weight of his suggestion as he understood that people without power and without resources and without advocates must decide what moves they can make within hellishly constrained conditions. The first move they must make, according to Thurman, is to realize that, like Jesus, they live in the presence of God who demands we shun hypocrisy and live in sincerity and honesty. What this sincerity and honesty entails, in the famous and overused words of Edward Said, is to speak truth to those in power, to give honest and sincere witness as best as one can to the realities of life, especially the affronts of injustice brought by the actions of those who have made themselves agents of death and have structured death into what they have created. The deception that the disinherited must shun is exactly the deception that those in power cherish. It is the deception that the way the world is being formed socially, economically, and politically reflects a natural order that should be accepted and echoed in the voices of those suffering from that natural order. So Thurman's deep wisdom, formed in part from reflecting on the words of Mahatma Gandhi, is turned sharply at upending a reality of deception that covers a false order, a delusion pretending to be natural, even God-given. I want to stay with Thurman's spiritual direction and bring a question about deception to the built environment to the building, the body, and the design. And I want to focus that question of deception on one fundamental reality of habitation, the home, and that which constitutes a home, housing and land. The home has become for us a site of deception from where a grand delusion emerges and around which it coalesces. What is the delusion? It has several characteristics, but at heart, at heart, it is the belief in ownership of the earth and life itself. And that belief is focused and materialized through the home. We are considering the redemption of habitation through the joined salvation of the body and the building, the creating and the designing. Our first lecture drew attention to the possibility of dwelling introduced to us through the life of Mary with Jesus and then the life of Jesus inside the teaching of Mary. 
through her testimony and her life in the land. Jesus draws those who follow him into the life of God through the Spirit and therefore into his own dreaming of the reign of God being realized in and through his life. It will be a reign down to the bone and the dirt. And from the bone and the dirt, the life of God unfolds within the life of the creature, and the life of the creature unfolds within the life of God, establishing the basis for new possibilities, new designs, if you will, for living and building in the freedom of God. Our second lecture considered the first challenge of those new possibilities. It is fear. And the reality of habitation constituted in fear and the formation of a false sacrality through priestly enclosures. We suggested that a renewed vision of the sacred must be built out from life with God rooted in the liberating work of Jesus. How might we create or recreate building, body, and design that are permanently fortified against fear? That is the question we left as we ended that lecture. And now we take up a next step in answering that question by considering the fundamental delusion that thwarts the redemption of habitation. The delusion of home constituted within a vision of ownership. At the heart of the natural geographic order that formed artificially is the idea that the world can and should and must be owned. That is, a vision of private, propertied existence. And from that idea has formed an arrangement that threatens life itself. Thurman's reflection on deception hovers around this arrangement when he states, all over the world, all over the world, there are millions of people who are condemned by the powerful in their societies to live in ghettos. The choice seems to be the ghetto or suicide. The ghetto or suicide. I want us to linger with these options. The ghetto here was a term in Thurman's day growing in use in literary, sociological, and political discourse, moving toward, moving toward becoming synonymous with black urban life. In this regard, it was aligning powerfully with its original use as being synonymous with Jewish life, forced into confined and controlled Venetian spaces. Yet Thurman's use of ghetto here anticipated what it means now, an emerging urban universal. That is, a spreading state of surrender for so many people who find themselves, find themselves living in constrained conditions, constrained by poverty, war, famine, violence, and a lack of affordable places to live. These options, the ghetto or suicide, are the materialization, the grounding, if you will, of the status quo. Thurman opines that to choose to live in this bone and dirt status quo is a form of compromise that must be understood in its depths. Those depths reach below the practices and strategies or moral reasoning of those in power or those comfortably housed and down to those whose hermeneutic is captured by a single goal, not to be killed, 
not to be killed. Thurman urgently wants to draw the disinherited out of this hermeneutic pit that he says tends to cheapen life. He's exactly right. But to draw people out of this pit requires we understand it not simply as a mental or spiritual pit, but also a pit constituted by the built environment where the displaced live in housing and on land that press them back into that single goal, not to be killed. Backs against the wall, indeed. A poem for us. Shotguns and shacks. They are called shotguns for a reason. Standing in the tiny kitchen with clear sight to the final wall, even the indentations pretending to be rooms are naked for perfect surveillance of bodies and all. A boss at either end can exercise their will, shout clean the space, and if necessary, kill everything standing, including the home. They are called shacks for a reason. Anyone with a gathering impulse can put one together with one good arm, driven by only one thing, not to be killed. Shelter, in the primordial sense, tentative materials, contingent design, they move while standing still. Maybe they're timeless, as Alexander says, but this pattern isn't home, it's survival. The question for us is why have we accepted a world formed and yet forming between ghetto and suicide with those in power and those comfortably housed in between? To consider this, we must meditate. We must meditate on one word that captures the heart of our delusion. It is the word possession. The idea of possession formed freshly through the new way the colonial settlers saw the world. To them and for them, the world became possession in an absolute sense. These Christian settlers saw possession through break, separation, and enclosure where native groups saw possession through continuum, connection, and overlap. The former, a possession of. The latter, a possession by. The former made a claim on something. The latter was claimed by something before one might, and I do mean might, imagine making claim on something. There is no small difference between these two. Being claimed by means everything. Consider the poem by, the poem remembered by the Native American poet, Joy Harjoy entitled, Remember. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the star's stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life. Also, remember the earth whose skin you are. 
Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them. Listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is. Remember. There is no small difference between being claimed by and making a claim on something. Because between these two ways of imagining possession, one world is being destroyed and another world is being created. Between these two ways of imagining possession, one way of forming home is being destroyed. And another way of forming home is coming into being. Our delusion is rooted in the, in the way of forming home that came into being with the colonial settlers. This way of forming home grew out of a sense of possession that made claim on something, and that something was the new world. The colonial settlers' sense of possession grew out of a belief in their centeredness. That centeredness, on the one hand, led them to conclude that God had given them the task of bringing the new worlds to maturity, to mature the body, the soul, and the environment, to make them all productive and able to yield their proper fruit in due season. That centeredness, on the other hand, led them to believe that God had given them the task to bring rational order to the new world. We can sense, we can sense the reality of whiteness forming with this order. They understood themselves to be at the center, the very center of the divine intentionality, especially in the new world. And that intentionality meant that they were announcing God's presence in the world through them, in the world through them. Here was a reality to be worked out. Divine presence in relation to their presence, calibrated by the level of productivity that the colonial settlers were able to achieve through what they built and who they cultivated. Yet the immediate imprint of presence happened through what they owned. The New Worlds saw, as many of you know, saw the flowering of presence through ownership. That presence was established through a burgeoning legal system that catalyzed precisely because of the need to organize a world forming inside of an ecology of possession and the canonization of greed. Two lines of a poem. In the beginning was the owner, and the owner was God, a beginning not to be reversed. Establishing presence through ownership was, in a classical sense, a powerful legal fiction. But it did real work in the world. However, in a more crucial sense, it is a theological act that not only extends the life of one into another, but also maps one body into another and indwelling. Ownership 
as it forms in the New World carries both slavery and freedom and hides in plain sight an extraordinary, an extraordinary absurdity. Consider an example of that extraordinary absurdity from the life of one Aulauda Aquiano, that famous African slave of the 18th century. On July 11, 1766, something incredible occurred. On that day, my friends, Aulauda Aquiano would purchase himself. Then in his 20s, he had worked tirelessly for that day. This was something to behold. An African slave would come into possession of himself. This extraordinary absurdity was made possible by the kindness of Aquiano's then current master, Robert King, considered by Aquiano his most compassionate owner. King agreed that he would allow him to buy himself for the exact sum, 40 pounds silver, that King paid for Gustavus Vassa, as he was then known. Gustavus would have to make money for his master, and then with the time and energy left, which was little, make money literally for himself. Aquiano records this event in his famous narrative when he states, when I had made my obeisance to my master and with my money in my hand and my fears in my heart, I prayed him to be as good as his offer to me when he was pleased to promise me my freedom as soon as I could purchase it. Now after delicate negotiation and the intervention of one Captain Farmer, Aquiano then tells us the result. My master then said he would not be worse than his promise, and taking the money, told me to go to the secretary at the register office and get my manumission drawn up. The first time I read these words, I was surprised, surprised by my response. I cried. Although separated by centuries and worlds, inexplicably, inexplicably, my friends, I felt this moment with him. But what, in fact, was this moment of self-purchase? Aquiano, in his narrative, includes his manumission form, which, according to him, illustrates this grotesquerie, one line of which reads as follows. I, Robert King, set free a Negro man-slave named Gustavus Vassa, hereby giving, granting, releasing unto him all right, title, dominion, sovereignty, and property, which as Lord and Master over the aforesaid Gustavus, I have had. This legal document transfers, let's not forget, transfers ownership from one party to another, and in so doing, shows us possession as the prerequisite for freedom. The language used in this document would be the same if the purchase and transfer had been for a cow, a horse, or for land. Alauda Aquiano, in this moment of self-purchase, moved from possession by another, indwelling by another, to self-possession. And in this regard, he remained in the dream of the colonial master's corporate body, a body that harkened back to royal claim, a body extended into their holdings. That corporate body for the colonial masters was necessary to launch and sustain a life of productivity and sovereignty and recognition that would guide their work of building. The development of ideas of sovereignty 
and autonomy and recognition are less important for our concerns because there is something far more decisive at play here. Forming in plain sight. It is the ability, the power to indwell that establishes freedom. There is a vision of freedom forming that requires possession and self-possession. It requires, it requires the indwelling of ownership. The spirit of ownership claiming the body, the spirit of ownership extending the body into the dirt, pressing the body across the land. And in this regard, it becomes a replacement for the spirit's indwelling. That is, the spirit of the owner is now in the land. And like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it both binds and liberates. This, my friends, is a pneumatology of ownership that as it grows through colonial modernity will allow all of us to envision our bodies extending into the land and enabling all of us, if we have the money, to create home. This pneumatology establishes a sense of presence that supplants divine presence in the work of building, body, and design. We missed this shift in Christian thought and Christian theology because it was a shift created by Christian practice formed inside ecologies of possession throughout the colonial world from the 16th century forward. If sacrality and practices of veneration were colonized, as we noted in the last lecture, then the divine omnipresence suffered the fate of supersessionism. God's presence was supplanted by the presence of owners in and on that which they claimed. And owners claimed everything. Of course, no colonial Christian owner or Christian slave master or Christian plantation owner or farmer or mine owner or business owner or their descendants or we who are Christian today would deny God's omnipresence. The point of this geographic and fiduciary supersessionism is that the presence of owners is far more decisive than God's presence within an ecology of possession. Now we'll return to the question of presence in a moment, but what is crucial for us is the way forming home through obtaining land, sequestering land, and building housing establishes absolute presence. A vignette that might be a poem I remember Sarah, my student, who was a farmer's daughter, raised in the farming life. She testified to me how her family loved the land, cared for the land, cherished the land. Yes, it was land taken from Native Americans long before her family took this farm but they honored the land. Her fever, now in full force as she talked, no sin here, Dr. Jennings, no guilt here, just the honest work of farming, creating good food and raising beautiful animals to feed people. Then I asked that question, Sarah, if I offer your family, especially your father and your grandfather, 
another farm, a different farm, or even an additional farm with much more good land, with significant opportunities to expand your growth, orchards perhaps, and more animals, more workers, more production. Sarah, would your father and your grandfather take that farm? Sarah paused and she did not laugh. She said, probably, and the fever broke. It is important to remember how the colonial masters looked at the land. They did not see it as many indigenous people saw it, alive, animate, and communicative. They did not see it as woven into their very lives, the very lives of native peoples. They did not see it as a fundamental, irreplaceable part of how one understands and identifies oneself. They did not see it as making a claim on us. They saw the land as property that could and should and would become private. Property that one may grow deeply attached to, even form a loving connection to, after you own it. And they forced indigenous peoples to see the land and think the land and speak the land through a private property vision of ownership and attachment. This meant that the land should be seen first in terms of its potential and thereby as a site for improvement. Secondly, as commodifiable, that is turned into segments and sold. And third, the land should be seen as transferable, as sellable segments. Indigenous peoples, to stay in any way connected to the land, would have to see the land in these ways and see themselves as owners of the land, having the rights to the land. Indigenous peoples had to not only see land as property, but had to articulate land in themselves through the ideas of ownership. They had to place the land in themselves in a similar absurdity to Aquiano's moment of self-possession. That is, they had to enact the spirit of ownership. Now, none of this is new historical news. But we have not carefully considered the effect of a world configured within this pneumatology. It has meant enacting a spirit of ownership as the only way through which to see yourself and your world and through which to know yourself and your world. We are, my friends, now deep into our delusion, born of colonial modernity, where a counterfeit pneumatology guides us into the work of seeing and the work of building, especially in the creating of home and the shaping of housing, life, and land. That work draws us into a compelling invitation. Claim yourself. Which brings us back to Thurman and those horrific options. Either the ghetto or suicide. And it brings us to the built environment formed between those options. If you are not successful at claiming housing, life, and land, then those options await. Thurman's spiritual guidance, Thurman's spiritual guidance, however, is yet true, is yet sure. The antidote to deception is God's presence. Yet allowing God's presence to interrupt our counterfeit pneumatology requires we consider what it might mean to sense God's presence and to address God's presence, to sense God's presence, and to address God's presence through the built environment, given the constructed impediments to sensing and addressing that reality. The impediment to sensing begins for us with the tragedy of the transformation of indigenous place 
into colonial space for how we today create home and function as builders and homemakers. Here we return briefly to the discussion of sacrality from that second lecture, where we noted that the colonial settlers formed visions of sacrality in places that refused to acknowledge, to know, to respect, and honor indigenous places dense with memory, knowledge, reciprocity with plant and animal, intelligibility, and family, both human and more than human. Through that colonial history, place has been deformed into space. To say that place has been deformed into space is to point to the history of mapping meaning onto places without regard to their histories or their connection to peoples and other places and with a view toward their commodification. Space has become for us a flexible, durable, and enduring conceptuality that now houses our perception of the world. We in the Western world have been trained to see place through space, which means that the first question, the first question that often forms in us and is expressed by us at the site of a place is this. Who owns this? This, my friends, is no small educational achievement because it is rooted in a spiritual transformation through the spirit of ownership. Our senses have been redirected by the transformation of the world into space. They have been turned toward a misguided productivity in the ways homes are designed, built, and maintained. That misguided productivity means that we build ever more deeply inside a possessing spirit. And with every building, every housing unit, and every neighborhood, we weave life more tightly into the logic of ownership and a vision of connectivity established only through ownership. The struggle to address the divine presence draws our imagination toward a particular kind of architecture and a particular kind of building, of holy place, church and temple or mosque, and the freedom to speak and the joy of being heard. Yet it is exactly that missing freedom and that absent joy of address that shapes so much of the built environment. This is the reality of the displaced, of confronting the logic of not to be killed, where they are not heard or seen or addressed directly, but only indirectly. Yet here we also meet a work of thriving life beyond mere survival. Between ghetto and suicide are the arts in resistance. They are the arts in resistance because they are the arts in residence. That is, the work of address under the constrained conditions of built environments formed in the spirit of possession. As the sociologist George Lipsick reminds us, we must always ground this work of address of the displaced in place, in the constrained conditions of places constituted in poverty, state control, police surveillance and brutality, and sites starved of social and economic resources. The arts in resistance form not simply out of the subjective states of individuals as incubated geniuses, but through resistance to a spirit of ownership constituted in a claimed space, one that seeks to claim them their people make art. Their people make art as a form of exorcism 
to speak their truth, address their world, claim their voice, and create through revolutionary vision. Yet because it is formed in configurations of housing and land permeated by the spirit of ownership, such work lives in the extraordinary absurdity of self-possession. Like land thought through possession, self-possession, as we noted with Aquiano, yields a deadening imaginative range. Either own yourself or allow someone else to possess you and your labor and your voice. Struggling for self-possession, however, has been with us in earnest since the founding moment of modern colonialism as people all over the globe, all over the globe, are fighting within and against nation states and corporations for self-determination of life and land. That work of self-possession for so many formerly colonized peoples aims backward in time in hopes of recovery of land and reparation and forward in time in hopes of protection and equality. Between these hopes, lay significant histories of frustration in trying to stem the tide of theft, commodification, and the accumulation of their life, lands, and their labor into the hands of others. This means that self-possession has been a way for the dispossessed to assert their presence where it is often denied. Here is where we need to situate the modern work of cultural self-expression and the aesthetics of self-possession as a work of psychic and spiritual intervention and healing. People all over the world, especially people of African descent, engage in this work, engage in this work, know very well what it means to work in the constraints of ownership. What do you do? What do you do when you own very little or nothing? Not the place you live in, not the land you work, not the ground that you daily traverse, not the places where your food is grown and harvested, and when even your body, your body is circumscribed by mechanisms of control and surveillance. You engage in performances of self-possession. In the words of the great Pharaoh Jasmine Griffin in her title of that marvelous book on Billy Holiday that she wrote, if you can't be free, be a mystery. If you can't be free, be a mystery, be a mystery by your actions, your gestures, your attire, your walk, your speech. Embody an inscrutability and an ineffability. Conjure a self-possession, conjure a self-possession that aims at possession. These are survival tactics and stratagems for creating abundant life in the absence of abundance. Between ghetto and suicide is self-possession and the assertion of a presence that claims life. Yet, is this the presence that we were promised? The one that speaks of the creature found in the unfolding, the creature formed for dwelling. Jesus invites his disciples into his own sensing and knowing of the spirit down to the bone and the dirt. We first meet possession as a reality of Jesus' yielding. The Holy Spirit, as with the prophets of Israel, as with his own mother Mary, takes hold of his life. But with him, it will be permanent, even eternal. This is the redemption of possession the redemption of possession, clarifying what it should be. No other spirit may claim the body or the land or any other creature, and no other creature may indwell another creature where the Holy Spirit is moving 
and claiming. The moving and claiming is everything because they bring us to the character of Jesus' interaction with creatures. There is the redemption of possession where other creatures are to the human creature as siblings are to one another and not as the Spirit of God is to the creature that is the one who indwells. We find in Jesus a reality of addressing and being addressed by the divine presence that establishes our presence in freedom without ownership. By the Holy Spirit, we enter the reality of being possessed, claimed by God, and therefore turn toward listening, embedded in building and building, woven into listening. Such listening honors the mystery of the divine life and the mystery of the creature both calling forth steadfast attention in the work of building body and design inside that attending. The sensing of God's presence and the addressing of that presence will always aim at refusing another spirit. It will refuse the spirit of ownership. It is that refusal that we need to create home today. But what might it mean in the face of built environments, configurations of housing and land constituted in ownership? This brings me then to the third and final element that must be coupled with sensing the divine presence and addressing the divine presence, and that is sharing the divine presence. We who follow Jesus have entered his shared life. Here we are called by the Spirit to a new work of shared creating, shared by all. This means not only the democratization of design, of housing and building and living, but also the reconfiguration of housing and building, land and living. It is a fact that the spirit of ownership has emerged for us as a tyrannical universal, placing people in the position of both slaves and masters, People's for, people forced to configure their lives by the ever-shrinking possibilities of affordable housing having their life energies and precious time slipping like sand passing through their hands as they travel vast differences between where they labor and where they caress their loved ones and lay their head at night for rest. People caught in but celebrating real estate deals that increase their wealth or simply give them the financial stability and security they need while at the exact same time making it impossible for vast numbers of people to afford the very home they just sold. People brought to their knees in exhaustion and prayer trying to make their monthly payments for their housing knowing that they have no room for error or no alternative living. Churches and schools selling their property, turning over their buildings and their lands to real estate brokers and developers to live another day, sing another hymn, pray another prayer, teach another student, all of it made possible by yielding to that spirit and claiming the power of ownership and being pressed to operate in a false pneumatology even as they pray, come Holy Spirit. And while this is happening, the option for so many remains and grows stronger by the day, either the ghetto or suicide. It would not be a new thought, as I conclude, it would not be a new thought to argue against private property or to argue for more communal living or to press toward a kind of geographic anarchy a practice of trespassing. But what would it mean to build, 
to form built environments structured in sharing. That's the word I want, sharing. What would, it, what would it look like to crumble ownership from within, to cast out the spirit and have places filled with the spirit of God, a spirit that invites us to a life of yielding and listening. It would involve many things, include many steps and starts, but it would begin with a decision to refuse the delusion that we own anything. And with honesty and sincerity to say and live the truth that we are claimed by God. As we turn to our final lecture, we will examine the crucial point of resistance to even reconceiving a built environment that aims at dwelling. That resistance brings us to the geographic formation of hatred and the way of love that must be materialized in the built environment down to the bone and the dirt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jennings. I just want to remind everyone that there will be an opportunity for real conversation about the issues that Professor Jennings is raising and his ideas this afternoon in a seminar at Harris Manchester College from 2.30 to 4. So that's the main time when we'll really have a chance to interact. And now there's a chance to have coffee. Thank you. <laughs>